Susan Watson, who is the Associate Professor of Physics at Millbury College, and uh, she um, has her uh, PhD from Cornell University and has done postdoctoral work at, I can't remember where, UCC San Diego, UCC San Diego. and uh, she's, done, she's doing research on uh, nanotechnology, mm -hmm. which uh, I'm sure she'll maybe explain a little bit. No. <laughs> um, there's the, uh, the next uh, next first Wednesday uh, will be uh, a talk on Gr Gertrude Stein, and there's a flyer out on the on the table there. And uh, there are a number of uh, lectures and programs coming up in the next uh, few weeks. And if you give me your uh, email address, I'll notify you of them. Of course, they'll be in the newspaper and the Times newsletter, which will be coming out in the next, uh, next few weeks. So uh, without further ado, oh, uh, one more thing, two more things. This is a Vermont Humanities Council event. And the second thing I was asked to do tonight was to find how, how many people are from outside of the town of Brattleboro. You can just raise your hand. Does Guilford count? Guilford counts. Come on, outside of Vermont. Come on, outside of Vermont. About a third of the crowd, would you guys say? <laughs> Quarter. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for showing up on such a cold night, and thanks for your patience while we got this technology to work. Um, let's see, we didn't quite work out the hand signals. I'll do something to like know here. Nearly 100 years ago, something truly extraordinary happened. This unknown, obscure 26-year-old patent clerk published five papers that completely revolutionized our understanding of the universe. <laughs> and in honor of Einstein, 2005 was dubbed the World Year of Physics by the international physics community. It was a UN-sponsored event, and in addition to that, societies that basically the organizing societies of the United States physics program had their own special events including programs throughout the year uh, in addition to that since Einstein's reach goes far beyond the physics community there are also talks that were sponsored through NOVA special programs and the arbiter of culture in the United States, Time Magazine, has its <laughs> <laughs> uh, Einstein, he was so well known throughout the world, but the, the groundbreaking, excuse me, groundbreaking work that he did had to do with these five papers that he published in a very short period of time of six months. And in those five groundbreaking papers, he completely altered our conception of light. He changed our understanding of, allowed us to measure sizes of molecules, and in addition to that, he did something that may seem surprising at this point. In 1905, there were still people who didn't actually believe in the existence of atoms, and he was somebody who gave proof for the existence of atoms in one of his papers. In another paper, he introduced this very unusual special theory of relativity that changed our understanding of space and time. And in a follow-up paper, he introduced this very famous equation, E is equal to mc squared. He's such a well-known individual that you have to go back about 300 years to find somebody, of a scientist in particular, of comparable um, sort of intellectual firepower. And that person was Sir Isaac Newton. He was the one who, at age of about 22 or 23, did things that are just amazing. He invented calculus. <coughs> He invented a theory of color. He introduced the first law of universal gravitation, which Einstein later replaced. And he introduced his laws of motion, which some of you may have learned about in introductory physics courses. 
Um, he also was a person whose reach went far beyond the physics community. He was somebody who, for the very first time, allowed people to believe that the universe really was something that could be understood. And it's hard to realize how important that was now, because we're so used to science and the scientific method. But at that time, it was very unusual. And it was Einstein who said 300 years later about, the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it is at all comprehensible, that, that these minds of ours that are made up of the same stuff that the universe is made out of, that we actually have the ability to understand the universe is amazing. But this isn't a story about Newton, it's a story about Einstein, so, so let's get back to Einstein. He's such an iconic figure that I imagine that any person who comes into this room probably has some idea of who Einstein is. And so I want to start by having you imagine Einstein. And possibly what comes to mind is this very famous photograph of him with the fuzzy white hair, almost the emblem of genius. Um, possibly what comes to mind is that famous equation, E equals MC squared, that people somehow believe maybe has to do with nuclear energy. It's much more general than that, and I'll talk about that a little bit. You may have an idea that he's associated with nuclear energy, nuclear bombs, and in fact, he didn't work on nuclear bombs. He wasn't involved in that, but people all often associate him with that. Or perhaps if you've taken a course on physics or done some reading on physics, you may associate Einstein with his special and general theories of relativity, which have to do with our conceptions of space and time. But no matter what you imagine about Einstein or what understanding you come into into this talk, I hope that you'll leave with something new, because what I'm going to try to do today is uh, maybe <coughs> dispel some myths and reinforce other myths and have some fun in the process. Uh, because what I want you to, to leave you with is an image of Einstein as somebody who was more than just a massive intellect. He was. He was this incre incredibly intelligent human being. But he was also somebody who was very unconventional. Or maybe I should say he's somebody who kind of shunned convention. And that meant that as a young man, and also as a late, uh, uh, later in his life as an older man, he was somebody who wasn't appreciated in terms of his abilities. And that's something I'm also going to try to convey to you tonight. So let's start back at the beginning. He was born in 1879 in Rome, Germany. This is one of the earliest photographs of him, date unknown. And he, his parents were uh, secularized Jews. And he, he, there, one of the uh, sort of common myths about Einstein was that he was kind of slow, almost like an idiot savant, this very brilliant man, but also slow in other ways. And it really is a myth. But there's a kernel of truth to it, as with any myth. His parents claim that he didn't actually begin talking until around the age of two. But once he did begin talking, he was talking in complete sentences, which leads you to believe that this was an individual who was taking in a lot more than his parents realized. So very intelligent young man, even at a very early age. We get an idea of his, where his curiosity comes from by his own memoirs. And in his memoirs, he talks about several miracles that occurred in his life. And one of the first miracles that he described was at the age of four or five, he was given a compass by his father. And he said this was just a wondrous thing to him, because you imagine taking that compass, and no matter which way you orient it, that needle knows exactly which way to point. It's always pointing north. And it, he said that it gave him the idea that there was something, something deeply hidden about nature and it just piqued his curiosity in a very profound way. A year after he was born, his family moved to Munich, which was a very fortuitous thing for him. His father had an electrochemical business. And what that meant in practice was, as Einstein was growing up, he became very familiar with electromechanical devices, things like motors, generators, and electrical circuits. If you have studied or read about any of Einstein's theories, they sound very deep, very mathematical, they are. But at the center of each one of those theories is a very simple idea and, and a very clear picture. And some historians of science believe that partly where that comes from is from his experience working in, with his father's gadgets in his factory as he was growing up. That is a picture of Einstein in the circle when he was around 10 years old. 
This is Einstein at age 14 with one of his closest companions throughout his life, his sister. And even at that age, or even before, by the age of 11 or so, he was a very formidable character. And partly the way that came through is looking at his memoirs. Um, at that age, he threw himself into all sorts of studies, one of which was studies, the study of the Jewish faith. In the process of doing that, within about a year or so, of uh, learning as much as he could, he very quickly became disillusioned and realized as he was reading the religious texts and really reading the scientific texts that there, was, there were contradictions there that didn't make sense to him. And what the impact that that had on him, the overall impact, was that he came to distrust authority. He came to believe that no one could really be the arbiter of truth, that he needed to figure that out for himself. Also around that age, he became very disillusioned with the style of teaching in Germany. It's very authoritarian, there's rote learning, people had to answer questions very quickly. If you didn't answer a question quickly, you were scolded, maybe even punished. And that also had a profound effect on him. It was something that didn't work with somebody of such a deep intellect. And it was, there's this famous quote by him, he said, it is in fact nothing short of a miracle that the modern day methods of instruction have not entirely strangled the holy curiosity of inquiry. For this delicate little plant, aside from stimulations, stands mainly in need of freedom. And that's a quote, by the way, that students still use on me to this day. <laughs> um, also around this time, when he was around 12 years old, he encountered what he considered to be his second miracle, and that was the beauty and purity of Euclidean geometry. Here was a subject where you could prove beyond doubt that certain things were true, and that just captivated his imagination. Um, also around this time, there was somebody who moved in with his family. It was a young medical student who decided that he was going to tutor Einstein in certain areas of mathematics. After Einstein essentially de devoured Euclidean geometry, he decided that he wanted to move on to the next area of mathematics, which was calculus. And just like with e Euclidean geometry, he mastered calculus, and his mastery of the subject was so amazing that this young tutor was, was just in a state of awe. He said, soon after teaching him, he said, soon the flight of his mathematical genius was so high that I could no longer follow. So here was a young man who was maybe about 10 years older than Einstein. Einstein at this point was only 12-ish, 13 years old, and already he was showing just incredible signs of genius. Uh, Instead of uh, finishing up high school in Munich, his parents, his father's electrochemical company, unfortunately went out of business. His family decided to move to Italy. And they told Einstein that it would be best for his studies if he stayed behind with his family, with relatives, finish his high school, school degree while his family went on to Italy, and then Einstein was to join them about a year later. Uh, as soon as they moved to Italy, within a matter of a few weeks, Einstein showed up on their doorstep. And he didn't give them any advance warning. He was, let's go back one. Sorry, I'm using too many hand gestures. He didn't give them any advance warning. And you can just imagine his parents' reaction. Here was a high school dropout. So this was a kid who hadn't finished high school. He was somebody who had no real direction in life. In fact, at that point, he wanted to become a philosopher. And fortunately for us, his father talked him into pursuing a degree in electrical engineering. And in order to do that, though, what they had to do was find an institution where he could get in without a high school degree. Fortunately, they found the Zurich Polytechnic. And uh, it turned out, though, that although he didn't need a high school diploma, what he did need was to pass an entrance examination. He took that examination. He promptly flunked chemistry, biology, French. But he did so amazingly well in mathematical mathematics and physics that he caught the attention of the director of the institute. And that director said, look, we'll accept you in a year. You have to go finish your high school degree locally somewhere. You don't have to go back to Munich. But locally, finish your high school degree. Then we'll let you into the institute, which they did. In the foot, yes? I think I'll answer your question. And that is, I remember reading somewhere that Einstein failed mathematics when he was 16 had to submit to a second examination before he could be admitted. 
there, there is sort of all sorts of circuitous aspects of the story that I'm glossing over. And so um, so the, the story is more detailed, and Einstein uh, had to, to sort of get some additional, had some additional work, but eventually he got into the Missouri Polytechnic. Once he was in, though, he then very quickly sort of alienated his teachers, uh, who were some very important thinkers and very well-known professors who were there. And there was one professor in particular who some of you may have heard his name, Minkowski, because he was very involved in, in sort of elucidating Einstein's work much later. He referred to Einstein as a lazy dog. And there were other people, I'll, I'll quote some other people, who had similar views of him um, as somebody who was lazy, he skipped classes, he, instead of doing the labs that he was supposed to do at this institute, he essentially took his lab notebook that he thought was too much rote learning again, tossed it in a trash bin, unfortunately the professor who was teaching that class found it, and the same professor said to Einstein, you're enthusiastic but hopeless at physics. For your own good, you should switch to something else, medicine maybe, literature, or law. What they didn't realize, many of these professors who held him in such contempt, was that Einstein was busy skipping classes not so that he could goof off. What he was doing was skipping classes so that he could go and learn the things that he was most interested in. Because you see, his professors actually weren't teaching him the latest physics. He wanted to understand things like the behavior of light, electromagnetism, the theories that were developed somehow in the mid, sometime in the mid 1800s, late 1800s, but hadn't yet worked their way into mainstream physics in terms of what was taught in the classroom. So he skipped his classes and he was doing something that is absolutely extraordinary if you think about what it takes to, learn, to read original literature. He was reading the original papers that were written on those subjects when his professors weren't even teaching it to him. So he was off on his own, busy learning all of this stuff, and it was around this time that he began to speculate about the nature of light, and that turned out to be very important for the development of special relativity. Unfortunately, since he didn't, uh, since in the process of, of, of finishing his degree here, he alienated so many of his professors, he wasn't able to get a job working with one of those professors right after graduating. His classmates, there were about seven of them, they were all immediately hired as assistants, which is a very important thing because that's the next route to getting a PhD, is you work with one of those professors. They essentially despised him, didn't want to have anything to do with him. So after leaving here and finishing, he then went, spent about a year or two uh, tutoring at a boarding school. He taught for a while. And finally, he was able to get a job as, through a close friend, as a minor civil servant, essentially, working in a patent office. And so that brings us to 1902. Here's Einstein. It was sort of the ideal job for him because he was so quick at reading through all of these patents that it gave him plenty of time to go back to the original literature and keep learning physics. But since he was, at that point, he didn't have any association with any sort of formal institutions, the way that he kept his hand in physics was by forming what he referred to and his friends referred to as the Olympian Academy, which is a really fancy name for a bunch of friends getting together in a beer hall and talking about <laughs> physics, which essentially they did. It was also at the same time that he married one of his uh, cohorts at the Zurich Polytechnic, and they later divorced, but they were both they were married in 1903. So that essentially brings us up to this miracle year, this absolutely astounding year when he published these five papers. Since this isn't meant to be a physics talk, I'm not going to go into detail about the physics, but I want to at least mention the topics in terms of what these papers had to do with. And the first paper that was published in June of that year really was the birth of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is the theory that really underlies all of our current understanding of the physical world. Up to 1905, there was very convincing evidence, absolutely unassailable proof, that light, the stuff that is on the screen that permeates the universe, that light is a wave. And, and you know from your own experience what waves are. I gave a few examples, water waves, sound waves, earthquakes. 
Waves are things that are spread throughout space. They're also things that can move through each other. So for example, when there is a ripple on a pond and another ripple that moves through that first one, locations where a crest of one of those waves meets up with a trough of another, they can just cancel each other out. And that process is sort of a key indication that something is behaving like a wave. Experiments were done, the, the smoking gun experiments were done in 1701 by Thomas Young that convincingly showed the world that light is a wave. Absolutely unassailable experiments. Then comes Einstein in 1905, and he interprets some experiments where a light wave, we call it a photon, that's the technical term for it, impinges on some special kind of a surface. And when it impinges on that kind of surface, it's able to give off an electrical charge. Einstein realized the only way you could understand those experiments was by postulating that light is not a wave, but in fact it behaves like a particle. Particles are things that behave very different from light. I gave a couple of examples. Baseballs, billiard balls, those are things that are very confined in space. They're localized, and they don't pass through each other. A particle can collide with another particle. It's as different as you could imagine from a wave. And in fact, if you had to divide objects up in the universe, you think of them either as wave-like or particle-like. Einstein was the first to realize that light can behave both like a wave and like a particle, and that is our current conception of not only light, but of actually of all objects in the universe. So absolutely groundbreaking, and that was the first steps to the development of quantum mechanics. So then, his second paper and third paper, I'll put both of those together, had to do with the proof of the existence of atoms. I'm showing here an image that wasn't made in 1905. It was made only recently within the last 10 years. And actually, it's about an hour to explain that image. It's so beautiful. <laughs> but it's an image that was taken by a special kind of microscope taken at IBM uh, in Albany, in Cal California. And each of these little blips here is actually an iron atom that was placed on a copper surface, a very special type of copper surface that was prepared in a very special way. The point is this. We can see atoms. Einstein couldn't. There wasn't the technology that allowed you to do that. We can now see, on, using these special techniques, atoms on a surface. In Einstein's time, the only way that you could see atoms was by seeing them in your imagination and postulating their existence. And the way it was done at that time was through understanding an experiment that had been done long before Einstein's time, but had puzzled people for many years. And the experiment was the following. If you take a dish of liquid, and look in it, just about any dish of liquid, if you have a microscope and look in it, you'll see particles jumping around. The person, person who first noticed this was somebody by the name of Brown, and initially he thought it was bacterial, so live things that were basically moving around in this dish. He took that same dish, though, and he had the intelligence to try something different, which was to intentionally put dust particles in that same dish, and, or a dish of liquid. <clears throat> so things that were inanimate, not alive, and yet he saw exactly the same kind of motion. Those dust particles were busy jumping around. Many people, after thinking about that for a while, realized that probably what was going on was that the atoms in that dish were jostling, those very, very small atoms, were jostling this much, much bigger dust particle, and that was the motion that they were seeing. But it took somebody of Einstein's intelligence to figure out a way of making a prediction that could actually be testable. And that's what he did. He made some very simple predictions of what would happen if you postulate that this particle is being jostled around by atoms. People then did the measurements, and they were consistent with his prediction. And that was the final proof to even the disbelievers that atoms are really what make up atoms. His fourth paper has to do with the special theory of relativity. Special here doesn't mean, um, doesn't mean special in the sense of nice. It means restricted. It means constrained. The much later, his general theory of relativity, to distinguish between general theory and special relativity, special theory, that name was, the special part was, was added as a tag. But mainly, it has to do with conceptions of space and time. This theory was one that he had been puzzling over in trying to understand the nature of light for about 10 years. So from about the age of 16 to about the age of 26, 
he was very, very concerned that things didn't quite make sense with what he was learning about electromagnetic radiation in the, his classes and the papers that he was reading, and what he was thinking about in terms of aspects of light that I won't go into because I don't want to cover the details, but there were some inconsistencies that disturbed him very, very deeply. And after banging his head against this for on the order of 10 years, he said it was finally as though a storm broke loose in his mind. And what he meant by that was he realized that for those 10 years, he was really looking at things in the wrong way because he was so used to conceptualizing this theory in exactly the same way that everybody else had. And he realized if he finally gave up on our common sense notions of what space and time actually mean, then everything fit together perfectly. And he was, at this time, he said, our common sense, or common sense in general, is the collection of prejudices acquired by age 18. That's what he realized, is that common sense was what was holding him back from actually seeing things that are so profound that we can't even begin to wrap our minds around them. So let me give you an example of how uncommon this actually is once you start looking at the consequences of Einstein's special theory of relativity. Here's what his, one of the consequences of his special relativity. Any object that is moving relative to you, even if I'm walking towards you, or running towards you, those objects become compressed in length simply by the fact that they're moving relative to you. We don't see this because in order to see these effects, the objects have to be moving incredibly, incredibly fast. The C that I have over here is the speed of light. 186,000 miles per second is the speed of light. And objects that are moving at speeds close to the speed of light there are noticeable differences in their lengths. And this is not just a theory, it's a testable theory. There are consequences of this, and it's been very well tested, and we see those consequences. Another consequence is referred to as time dilation. Objects that move relative to you, time slows down for them. Again, it's just completely mind-boggling. The idea that what we think of as space and time could be completely different from our common sense notions, and yet that's what Einstein's theory teaches us. Finally, in this last paper that he wrote, the fifth of, of those papers was really an addendum to this paper on special relativity, and it's the famous equation E equals mc squared, where E is energy, m is mass, the stuff that we're made out of, and c is the speed of light. And what this equation is really saying is that energy and mass are the same thing. So again, something that, that no one had really conceptualized before, light is a form of energy. You take light, and it's possible to take that light and turn it into particles. That wasn't done around Einstein's time. It was only done much later. Likewise, there are certain particles where you can take a particle and what's known as an antiparticle, the complete opposite in some sense of that particle. They come together, they collide, and they turn into pure energy. That equation, though, has much more to do than, say, with nuclear energy. It shows up even in chemical reactions that there are slight changes in mass that get turned into energy. And it's a, an equation. Yes? Can you say anything in more detail about going off on a, getting diverted from your lecture on why is the speed of light square? Um, why, 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 why not cube or why not the speed of light yeah, square? Yeah, right. I mean, energy units typically, you could you could do sort of a dimensional analysis, and that's, I'll, I'll give you just a, a 30 second answer to that without going into a lot of detail. The, the typically energy of motion for an object involves a speed square. And so, so, so all I'm do, doing is deferring your question and saying that you would also need to understand how speed squared enters into um, all sorts of types of, of energy. So there's this particular type of energy of motion that's referred to as kinetic energy. And even in that uh, simpler form of energy, it's a speed squared that it enters into it. So I'm not really answering it, I'm sort of deferring your question, but, but it's not, it's not a, Excuse me, it's not surprising that it comes as, as a speed square. Yeah, it's one other thing, there's an amusing note about that. When Einstein derived that equation, the, the square of the velocity of light, he was once asked, what was the velocity of light? And he said he didn't know. And when he was asked why, he said, 
why should I burden my mind with a lot of extraneous facts when I can look at, just as easily look it up and it's like... Exactly, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, so those five papers then were the groundbreaking work. And, and I want to pause for a moment before going on and just realize, get you to realize how absolutely incredible this was that he was able to do that. First of all, he wrote these papers in his spare time. So here's somebody who was working 40 hours a week, and he does this in his spare time, right? Think about, about that. He didn't have, at this time, any formal connection to an academic institution. He wasn't working with any professors. He didn't have any colleagues in institutions that he was working with. He was working completely outside of academic institutions. And in fact, he didn't have a PhD at this time either. He tried to submit his special theory of relativity as a PhD thesis. And the professors who he submitted it to were um, they had no way, no understanding of what he was, what he meant. They said it was so uncanny that they rejected it outright. They didn't know what to make of it. And he realized the only way he was going to get past these individuals was essentially by submitting something that was the easiest for them to understand, really. And that was his paper on uh, the sizes of molecules, which is what he submitted for his PhD thesis. So I want to sort of fast forward a little bit and talk about now 10 years later. So, so within about a year, he was recognized by the physics community. They started to realize that there was something very unusual in what he was saying in these papers. They picked up on it. He became well known within the physics community, but he doesn't, didn't make it on the world scene until after he developed his general theory of relativity, which took him about 10 years to develop. He said, special theory of relativity, that was a cakewalk. This was the really difficult theory. This was, if you've ever looked at it, any of this, is incredibly deep and obtuse mathematics. But the idea, again, there's a very simple idea at the center of his, uh, center of his theory, and that is that the general theory of relativity is a theory of gravity. What I've shown here is a sort of web of what happens to space in the vicinity of a massive object. So let's go back to Euclidean geometry, the kind of geometry we all learn in grammar school. Euclidean geometry is the kind of geometry where space is smooth, parallel lines go on forever, they never meet. And what Einstein realized is that if there's any object, any object that has mass associated with it, the presence of that object actually changes the nature of space and time in its vicinity. So this web that I'm showing here is showing how space is actually warped near a star, for example. Which means that if you have, looking at this picture down here, if you have a star and some nothing between that star and the Earth, the starlight will move in a straight line directly towards the Earth. If, on the other hand, there are some distant stars or objects and something like the sun is in its path, the sun is so massive that it warps space around it, and that starlight will move in a curved path. And that's what Einstein predicted in 1916. You can see that in his notebook that I showed over there on the right. And, and actually, it was even earlier that he predicted that. But it wasn't convincingly shown until 1919, when some experiments were done by Eddington. And then Einstein literally made it onto the world scene. So here he is, 1920. and. Uh, on the left, looking very dapper. At this point, he had, he and his cousin Elsa had gotten together, who he later married, and um, he was both a very prestigious figure in, in the physics community, but also somebody who was definitely on the world stage by this point. So what I want to now spend some time talking about is how do you even measure the the sort of worth of somebody who's that amazing. One way of doing that is, I think, by looking at the number of Nobel Prizes that were directly and indirectly related to his work. So, so within the physics community, one way of measuring his influence is to look at all of these Nobel Prizes that really wouldn't have been possible without his ideas. Many of those are related to uh, to his work on light, that light was a particle, has these particle-like aspects. Some of them have to do with general theory of relativity. None of those, though, would have been possible without Einstein's idea. So it gives some measure of 
his impact. You can also just look at technical devices that wouldn't be possible without him. Things as common as solar cells, photocells, lasers, optical fibers that are used in sort of medical probes, global positioning devices, and things like satellite communication. You may not realize it, but anytime you use satellite communication, Einstein's general relativity is taken into account. You think of general relativity as being so abstract that you have to do some very fancy experiment in order to detect it. No. Anytime you use a satellite, general relativity comes into it because you have to make corrections based on general relativity. And of course, one measure of his success and impact is the Nobel Prize that he won in 1921. And But this has an interesting t story, too. He was still such a controversial figure at this point, meaning that his special theory of relativity, his general theory of relativity, weren't fully embraced by the physics community, that he actually didn't get his Nobel Prize for either of those theories. That may surprise you. He got his Nobel Prize for his theory on the nature of light, that light has these particle-like aspects to it. And in fact, his theories on special relativity and general relativity were so, still so controversial that the prize committee said, do not talk about those theories in your acceptance speech, which of course he ignored. <laughs> so, let's go on now. And I want to try to address why this person made it onto the world stage in the way he did. Because it's, I mean, for me, that's partly what's fun about giving a talk like this. The physics part is the part I know. But even having to think about how somebody influences the world is, is interesting to me. And one of the things that I came across, again, in that wonderful Time Magazine article, which actually is a nice, nice article, was um, a person who, who said the following. He said, to the world at large, relativity seemed to pull the rug out from under perceived reality. And for many advanced thinkers of the 1920s, from Dadaists to Cubists to Freudians, that was a fitting credo reflecting what science historian David Cassidy calls the incomprehensiveness of the contemporary scene. The fall of monarchies, the upheaval of the social order, indeed, all the turbulence of the 20th century. So in some sense, he captured his era. And he did that unintentionally. That wasn't what he was setting out to do. But this idea that our common sense notion of the world is completely wrong, I think, did captivate people. There's this lovely cartoon where all these people are wandering around, scratching their heads, and they're contemplating the nature of reality. Some of his, he was so popular that his papers, his research papers, were posted on, in public places where people could go up and try to read them and make sense of them. Not an easy thing to do, but people were so curious that they wanted to know what was in these theories. Yeah. Um, since he was able to overcome uh, common sense prejudices, the thing I've never understood is why he had so much trouble with quantum theory, with quantum entanglement, uh, because it seems like he was stuck in common sense reality. He couldn't suspend that for a moment and say, well, the data, the, statistic, the statistical results of, of, of experiments show that there's something here, and even though it doesn't seem to make common sense, let me delve into it. He just totally seemed to it, it reject it. It was deeply inside. disturbing to him that, that the world could be probabilistic in nature, and that's what quantum theory says, is that instead of the world being predictable, um, which is what classical physics tells you it is, quantum theory says that, that there are certain likelihoods for things to happen, but that's the best that we can do. And that was, it was so deeply disturbing to him that he couldn't get past that, and he never did get past that, and I don't know how to answer your question. Um, because I don't know how to get into his head to, to see why he wasn't able to get past that. We have uh, experiments now that he, he was somebody who, who liked to do what he referred to as thought experiments. He would puzzle through things in his own head and try to come up with contradictions and get people to address those contradictions. One thought experiment that he came up with had to do with, with just the nature of reality that you're talking about, quantum physics. And it became such an important thought experiment that real experiments were done within the last 20 years or so um, that convincingly show that this, this aspect of quantum mechanics that was so disturbing to him is, in fact, the way reality works. So 
if he had been able to live to the time where he saw those experiments, then I don't know what would have happened. But but it's it's he he wasn't able to see some of the consequences of those later well, things. Quickly, uh, later developed the quantum theory was Max Planck, but uh, did, was there any record of the two of them getting together and helping resolve that? Uh, n well, they had many debates. So, so Einstein was very involved in, in, in very important ways in how quantum mechanics developed. But he was stuck in just the way that gentleman mentioned, is he never accepted some of the basic premises of quantum mechanics. And he never got past that. So, and that was quantum theory, because quantum yeah. mechanics was under Heisenberg. Uh, quantum theory, quantum mechanics, those are the same thing. So those are used interchangeably. Oh, thank you. So um, let me get back to, to trying to sort of tease out why this individual is so famous. I read an article in Scientific American about a year, year and a half ago or so. And one person made a nice play on this E is equal to MC squared. The author said, really, Einstein was a man of conscience. And, and that's partly why he made it onto the world stage. And it, it is true. He was somebody with very deep convictions. He raised money for a university in Israel. He brought. Uh, refugees, uh, Israeli Jewish refugees to the United, the United States during World War II. He was somebody, one of only a handful of scientists uh, right around the time of World War I, who signed a petition, a very outspoken petition against the war. He took these very bold stands, and partly that had to do, I think, with his kind of disdain and distrust of authority. He felt free to do that. So he definitely was a man of, of conscience. And this shows him in the United States raising money, uh, sort of touring the United States, raising money for this uh, school in Israel. He was somebody who was also very outspoken against McCarthyism much later in his life. Um, but I think, and this, this shows the, the anti-Semitism that was directed towards him. This is a photograph taken in 1932 very soon before he was forced to, to leave Berlin for his own safety. So he was very deeply affected by what was going on in the world and, and very outspoken. But I, I also think that although both of those aspects, that, that he captured the imagination of the people and, and that he was definitely a man of conscience, both of those are true. But, but I also think that, that there are there are brilliant people who are people of conscience who still don't make it onto the world scene in the way Einstein did. And I think, as I try to puzzle through this myself, there has to be something more than that. And I think partly it's the force of his personality. This was somebody who always had a pithy remark at hand. You mentioned a few. And he was somebody who was witty, he was approachable. So this brilliant person was also somebody who could relate to people in a very direct way. And in fact, this is showing him uh, giving a speech, he was often interacting with the public. In fact, he was so good at re relating to people that his colleagues, when they started to realize that there's the possibility of a controlled nuclear chain reaction, rather than going to President Roosevelt themselves, they realized they wouldn't have the sort of impact unless they had somebody of Einstein's stature to essentially put his stamp on it. They wrote a letter and got Einstein to sign his name at the bottom and took that letter to Roosevelt, and that was the start of the Manhattan Project. Einstein didn't have anything to do with the Manhattan Project. He didn't work on the development of the bomb. And in fact, the United States government didn't trust him to be a part of that project, so he was never involved. When the consequence, yes? Now on that, there's another humorous note. When Einstein came to this country in 1933, you mentioned anti-Semitism, one of the groups that raised a real row against him was the Daughters of the American Revolution. And a lot of his friends got very upset, because there's another thing, Greek times, the, when the Greeks were invading Troy, there were a group of geese that started cackling so loudly that they woke up the Trojan garrison, and they were able to repel the Greeks. Now, the thing was that Einstein made a reference to this, because when the Daughters of the American Revolution raised this real cry, and his friends were upset about it. He said, now, now, let's not worry about the ladies. After all, it was the cackling of the geese that was ain't broke. Exactly. That's, that's the way he deals with people who, and it's this very lovely, <laughs> clever way. 
the, the consequences, as we know, of, of those bombs were um, deeply, deeply disturbing <coughs> to him. And after those bombs were dropped, his, his lament was the following. He said, if I had only known, I would have been a locksmith. It, it was just sort of appalling to him to think that these ideas of his, these abstract ideas, could be used uh, to such destruction. And he, he expended a great deal of energy then working against uh, nuclear proliferation and, and was very outspoken against that. One of his famous quotes was, I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. It's just such a chilling, absolutely chilling remark. Mm -hmm. um, let's, since I don't want to keep you for too long, I want to go through just a few more minutes of Einstein's talking about Einstein's legacy, the work that's still being done to this day that is a consequence of his ideas. I mentioned before this idea from general relativity that massive objects warp space. And there are some experiments that are being done. I show down here light that's going through a lens, just like the lens in your glasses. And essentially, the equivalent is that space can can be warped by the presence of mass, and it does essentially the same thing as a lens. That's what Einstein taught us. That image over there on the right is an image of a single object that we see as multiple objects because in the process of going from the object to the Earth where we are, there's a big galaxy in between, and the light from this object gets bent around that galaxy and comes back to us, and we see it as multiple objects. So that's an example of the warping of space that we're able to now see. Another <coughs> example is the idea that the fabric of space, of space itself can have ripples in it. So for example, there are a couple of massive objects right here that rotate <coughs> and, and move around each other. In the process of doing that, they send out little ripples through space. And one of the big experiments that's underway right now is trying to detect those ripples in space. Those are called gravitational waves. Those haven't been detected directly, but there were some people who indetect, indirectly detected them and won the Nobel Prize in 1993, excuse me, for that work for the indirect detection of these ripples through space and time. And more recently, in 1924, Einstein and a colleague predicted this very special state of matter that was recently convincingly shown in 1995 independently by two separate groups. And more recently yet, in 2001, they won, those groups independently won the Nobel Prize in Physics for experimentally detecting this very special state of matter. And Things like black holes, these very exotic sorts of objects that are a consequence of general relativity, those were predicted based upon general relativity. Einstein wasn't the one who predicted the black holes, but they're based on his theory of general relativity. It's now believed that at the center of most galaxies, there are massive black holes, these things that are busy gobbling up matter. So very exotic objects, and this shows the last blackboard that he was working on when he was in Princeton, I mentioned right at the beginning of the talk that he was somebody who was underappreciated early in life and also later in life. And there's a quote here that, that from an Einstein biographer, this was a physicist also, that kind of captures the way he was viewed in the physics community later in his life. This person says, in the remaining 30 years of his life, he remained active in research, but his fame would have been undiminished if not enhanced had he gone fishing instead. <laughs> and the, the point this person was making was that Einstein spent his last years working on what he called his grand unification theory, this idea that instead of having separate forces of nature, you could unify all of that into one grand theory that explained everything. And there were many physicists who thought he was on a wild goose chase and, and really didn't take his work seriously. Now it is a, 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 almost like an industry. There are so many people in physics who are working towards trying to come up with some sort of a grand unification theory. It's taken very seriously. It just wasn't taken seriously during his lifetime. I want to leave you with an image that, that I adore of Einstein and also his words. He, he said the following about 
curiosity. He said, the important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. One cannot help but be in awe when he contemplates the mysteries of eternity, of life, of the marvelous structure of reality. It is enough if one tries merely to comprehend a little of this mystery every day. And finally, let me leave you with an, the, an interview that he had. There's a journalist who was interviewing him, and this journalist asked one of those questions that journalists like to ask. What is your formula for success? I mean, that's like lobbing something at Einstein, right? Um, he, and he said the following. He said, my formula for success. I have to say the formula would be, if success is A, the formula would be A equals X plus Y plus C. X being work and Y being play. And of course, the journalist then asked, well, what is Z? To which Einstein replied, keeping your mouth shut. <laughs> Let me leave you also with my sources. I'm, I'm not an historian. I'm not a soci sociologist. I'm, I'm a physicist. And so I come at this from a physicist's point of view. And I relied very heavily on all sorts of different sources, including, I'll put in a plug for my colleague at Middlebury College, Rich Wolfson, who is an expert on Einstein, I'm not, um, wrote a very lovely book on relativity that is very approachable and very clear. If somebody wants to read about both special relativity and general relativity and some of these other articles and websites. And now I'll open it up to, to any questions that you have. Thinking of Einstein and his mind, what do you think he'd feel about some of the things going on today, say, the exploration of the moon and Mars, um, what, how would he regard that at, with, in his own theory? Is in his own theory? Perfect. Well, I, I don't know how to answer your question. As soon as you ask that, I think about my, my own response to them, which is not quite what you're asking, is it? Um, I, I, I don't know how you respond. In terms of, I mean, I think he would probably be amazed at how how far his theories have gone to explain so much, and how certain aspects of his theories that were even rejected by him um, have now been embraced as ways to explain what's going on in the universe. In terms of things like exploring the moon, exploring Mars, um, I suppose if you, if you force me to give you an answer, I would say it's, it's all consistent with his sense of awe and sense of being curious about the universe, the idea that we should explore. I'll give you my own response, which is I'd rather see research money go to something other than the exploration of, of Mars in the way that I think Bush is proposing, which is to send manned vehicles out there. The explore, exploration that we're doing right now with unmanned vehicles is beautiful. Put the Hubble amazing. in there, too, then. Hubble is amazing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in 1905, there really wasn't a lot of fast-moving vehicles. So how do we come up with this special theory of relativity? Excellent question. I mean, that's what's so amazing, is that he was able, and, and this goes back to the comment that I made before, that for 10 years, he was trying to reconcile his understanding of the theory of basically electricity and magnetism, which is where the understanding of light comes from. And there are certain things that just didn't make sense, and he didn't find any way of explaining those things until, as he described it, sort of, as he said, a storm broke loose in his mind. He, he, he in his own words, said that, um, as he was recalling later in life, there was a children's book that he was familiar with where there is this character that runs alongside a light beam. And he was very curious about what the world would look like if a person could actually do that and run as fast as, as a light beam. And thinking about that got him thinking sort of in the right direction where he finally realized the only way he could reconcile these theories was by getting rid of our common sense notions of, of space and time. And there's there, there there's more that sort of tipped him off that, that I can't really go into, but um, it was pure logic. I mean, that's partly what you're getting at, is there's no experience, there's nothing in our common day experience that allowed him to see the special theory of relativity was true. It was pure logic. It was getting to the point where you say, the only thing that's going to allow me to make sense of the world is by getting rid of our common sense notions of space and time. So it's just amazing that he could take that kind of 
imaginative leap and do that. Weren't there mathematicians that uh, really laid the groundwork with theoretical, abstract work that, that he then applied? I mean, there are people who go. There are yes, yes. So there, there's. Um, there's mathematics associated with things called the Lorentz contraction. There's all sorts of, of groundwork that was done. So you may say that the time was kind of ripe for what he was doing. But actually, what some of those other people were trying to do was um, take what they saw as experimental results and fix them up in a certain way. And, and there's controversy over whether Einstein was even aware of some of the uh, Kind of groundbreaking experiments that we now use when we're teaching physics to show that, that special relativity makes sense. But there was there's some controversy whether he was even aware of those at the time that he was developing his theory. After all, he had been thinking about this stuff for about 10 years, which was even sort of before this work was done. It was right around the same time this work was done. So it's it's not as though he led directly from from those other theories to, to his work. In 1905, without any university affiliation, under whose auspices did he publish? And yeah. why would I have read it? Right, exactly. No, I mean, that's, that is exactly what I wanted you to realize, is that, that this is unthinkable now, and it's hard to even imagine that it ever was true, that somebody could take some papers, send them into a journal, and be completely unknown and have those journals accepted. I think it probably would have been more acceptable at that time than it is now with all the whole the whole peer review process that we go through and he probably couldn't have done that. The only reason that his papers were recognized was that Max Planck, who was somebody who was a very famous physicist who had worked on quantum mechanics, noticed these papers and realized that there's something very unusual going on there. So um, it was a different time when somebody could actually do that, but it was astounding still that he was able to actually get away with it. I think your hand was next to Hey, uh, I was just thinking of that, that famous or infamous <laughs> story of the fly in the train that is traveling 150 miles an hour or something like that. Is the fly flying at the same speed? Does that have anything to do with Einstein's theory of relativity special or not? You'll have to explain more of the story. I'm sorry. The, it, this is um, of the way the fly looks. Is that what you're saying? In other words, there's a fly flying around in a train. Uh -huh. The train is traveling at 150 miles an yeah. hour. That, that is, and, and yet you're not, that, it's not um, directly related to his special theory of relativity. It is related to a way that we describe uh, both special relativity and just the regular non-special uh, relativity. Um, anytime an object is is moving sort of in a train or something. That that reference it has exactly the same speed as that reference frame that it's moving along with, and you don't even notice its motion. Um, it's let's see, it's sort of indirectly related to Einstein's work in the sense that he, the, one of the things that he said in his general theory of relativity too was that there are no experiments that you can do that would allow you to tell whether some object that's moving at a constant speed relative to you, um, if, if, let me say it differently, if you were locked inside of a train and you had no way of looking outside of that train, there's no experiment that you could do in physics that would allow you to tell whether that train is moving at a constant speed what, relative to the ground. And his relativity theory captured much, much more than that. That's sort of a basic statement of physics. So it's, it's the fly kind of example is um, special relativity is much more than, than talking about uh, motions of objects in that, in that sense. Yeah, so going back to the 1905 and his five papers, was he writing these right then and turning them in, or were they, had they been accumulating over the last few years and had suddenly yeah. they Max Planck solved it or what? He had, he had been working on the ideas for several years. So, so it's not as though he began working on all of those papers within a single year and published them. He'd been working on them for a fairly long time, but it was at that point where everything just came together. And that's when he published all this work. And just absolutely. I was kind of curious about an academic affiliation. 
libraries must have been important to his life. Uh, and he was, uh, <laughs> Um, nowadays, I would, I would assume that there's a lot more physics research going on than there was 100 years ago, just because there's more people and yeah. more physicists. I mean, it's, it's in a more formal sense. Right. Do you think there's room for another Einstein? Yeah, it's a good, figure? good question, because it's, it's hard to imagine somebody being that much of an outsider and being taken seriously. Right. And um, so, so I think probably the level of doubt would be even higher than it was around the time of 1900, I think, because there were sort of independent scientists in the 1800s and, and um, before then, but it's become harder to, to, to sort of survive outside of the academy. And it, it makes you wonder how much those of us who have gone through training in whatever field you've gone through, you know what it's like. Your, your view of the world gets narrower and narrower, and you become more conventional. And the idea that somebody could come, come at things from such an outsider's perspective, um, it makes you wonder what we're losing by, by not having those outsiders. Yeah. Um, there, there's been research done, and sometimes, because it's such an honor to come up with something new, people have actually fabricated results to, to be more important. And then they've later proven that it wasn't accurate. Yeah. And so, I mean, sometimes it's like, it's such a strive to be ahead to do any means to get there. So much pressure. There's a famous case of somebody by the name of Schoen at Bell Labs. In Bell Labs, uh, now known as Lucent Technologies, but at that point, one of the biggest research most important research centers in the United States for physics, and those people were cranking out papers nonstop. It was just a factory, and doing beautiful work, um, and unfortunately, just about uh, five years ago or so, it was re recognized that one person had been actually fabricating his data, and it's amazing that the people didn't catch it. He was taking exactly the same figures, publishing them in different papers. And after a while, people recognized what was going on. And he never admitted it, but it was it was just absolutely clear. His, he sort of disappeared from the world scene. And I don't know whose hand was next. But in the back, yeah. Um, there's a whole, there's slews of books about particle, modern physics and particle physics written for the lay person. That is, Pick up Kappa's and Tao physics. It must be a 50 titles at least. Uh, maybe you've seen some of them. But I tried reading a couple of them, not ever having passed a, uh, or barely passing a high school physics class. And I came to the conclusion that, that these books are deceptive. Uh, uh, that you think you're maybe understanding something, but if you don't understand, if you're, that the real work is being written in a different language. It's not English. It's the language of math. Right. And and um, and just recently I listened to some recorded lectures. Actually gone right here at the Pellegro Library <laughs> History of Science and the guy was saying that that the language of physics, it, that things like subatomic particles, whatever, there's no language to describe their movements. That the language is mathematics. In other words a professor was saying confirming my oh, intuition. I, I think you're so, right. So, uh, I mean, there's all these books that uh, explain, including books on Einstein, that they yeah. claim to explain it, um, you know, uh, Einstein's cosmos. So, the, the, in other words, yeah. your, your books, including mm -hmm. your books up there, but isn't it a, a little bit of a farce, or maybe that's a, a, for us to read sure. it, I think we're getting it. Sure. Well, look, it's it's an unintended farce, but but I, I I see your point, and I agree with your point that this is always one of the challenges. How do you take a subject that is based on a different language, mathematics, and do any justice to that subject without um, losing something in the process by not using mathematics? And that's it's it's always a problem. There's always something that you're losing, and the question is, can you convey enough to give a sense of sort of the essence of what's going on? And what I typically do when I teach physics courses is actually I'll rely on some of those same books that you find dissatisfying because my students become so used to just reading and taking in the mathematics, sometimes they lose sight of the big picture. 
And I think you need to do both. You need to have the mathematical foundation to learn the physics, but then some of these books that kind of gloss over the mathematical details, they're also excellent books because they make the reader focus on why what we're talking about is important. But well, I, I agree with you. They're point. often written by people who are very reputable in the field who know the okay. math. Right. But, but leave it out, but, but you, one wonders what you're, what you're getting when you read that without yep. them. There's always something that's lost, and, and I agree. Did the Doppler effect precede Einstein, or was it post Einstein? That is an effect that's been known for a long time, so that's, I, I don't know what date that was, but I would say somewhere in the 1800s or something. So. Doppler effect, the idea that you have this. How was it explained before um, the Well, there's the, the t let's see. Um, we have to remember how, I think, using sort of the ideas of relative, the ideas of relative motion. Einstein wasn't the one who introduced those ideas. Ideas of relative motion had existed for a while. Oh, and, and when you say Doppler effect, there are Doppler effects not just for light, if that's what you're referring to. Uh, there's, Doppler effect is an effect that shows up um, for any type of wave motion. So the type of Doppler effect that I'm referring to, people have discussed that. It's sort of the relative motion of objects, even before Einstein. In order to, to understand what's going on with the Doppler effect with light, then you need to understand more about the nature of the speed of light, and, and Einstein comes into it in that sense. There was an explanation, and this may help a few people here. I, I had struggled for a long time trying to understand that, uh, that, that time and distance were the same, and couldn't figure that out and then it was in a book maybe it was a, it was a book about Einstein's work but the writer said has anybody ever asked you how far away something was and you said it's about 10 minutes away so you sort of do it naturally and I just understood it right then what how time and distance were the same what about gravity is that a a wave, a particle, is it a bend in space-time, or all of those things? Um, there's, according to Einstein's general theory of relativity, gravity, the effect of gravity is, is this sort of warping of space. Um, there's a particle called a graviton, yeah, which sure. is a particle that's exchanged, the, the interaction, it sort of is, is the way that objects, one way of thinking about the way objects speak to each other. Um, so when that bend happens, these objects move, or? No, think of the, the, the bend part separately. But there okay. is this space that is warped by, by the presence of mass. And that's sort of as deep as I can get without starting to, to really lose the. Maybe, um, maybe we get a chance for some people to, to leave. And yes, perhaps you would course. be willing to spend a few sure. minutes talking individually to, yes. to people. Thank Great. you for your attention. Thank you very much.